In 2016, our, our community was, was hit with a, a tragedy. Young girls from UGA, their lives were lost in a terrible car accident, and one of those lives was Hallie Scott. And uh, that was Hallie's parents, Steve and Valerie Scott, that you just saw there giving their testimony. And ever since that happened back in 2016, I've been in touch with Steve and Valerie over the years. And they, they started doing this, this hike up to Stone Mountain, um, Hallie's hike. And Hallie loved to hike, and she loved to watch the sunrise. And so they began this hike about five years ago. And I've had the opportunity to be a part of several of those hikes, and many of you have too. And it's been just a, a true blessing to, to hike. It's not an easy hike if you've ever hiked Stone Mountain, especially the, the last quarter of a mile. It's woo, you know, and I don't want to go up there if it's raining. Luckily, we didn't go when it was raining. But when you get to the top and you see that, that sun come up, you just know, you just know that God is awesome. He is amazing. And we got to do the hike uh, two weeks ago, and it's a great group of people. And as we got to the top, I just felt the power of God's Spirit. I felt Hallie's Spirit there. I, I just, I can't put into words what I was feeling at that moment. And I had asked Steve and Valerie to, to do a, a testimonial for our, our new membership lunch that we had a few weeks ago. And and didn't get to show that when I wanted to show it last week because we ran out of time. And I wanted to show it today because God has really been with them through this entire journey. And I think all of you who know them, you know that. And you see the Lord moving and acting in their lives in a powerful, powerful way. Um, do they still have sadness? Do they still have grief? Absolutely. All of us do. But God has been faithful. And he's here. And as we stood and watched that sunrise, and we just heard that song the band did, Hello, My Name is Forgiven, and I Lift My Eyes Up, From Whence My Help Cometh. And that Psalm 121, it's a psalm that we recited while we were up at the top of that mountain and watching that sunrise. I lift mine eyes unto the hills, from whence my help cometh. My help cometh from the Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He will not let your foot slip he who does not sleep or slumber on all of his holy mountain. Think about that for a moment. He will not let your foot slip. He who never sleeps, he who never slumbers. And then, I didn't, I didn't quote this verse, but it's a verse that was on my heart while we were up on the top of that mountain from Isaiah 43. It goes like this. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and the waves, they will not overcome you. When you pass through the fire, I'll be with you, and the flames, they will not consume you. Do you ever feel like you're being consumed by the waves and the flames, that you're drowning? And then Isaiah goes on to say, as he is, he is quoting from the Lord himself. The Lord has given Isaiah these words to record. He says, Do not fear, for I have called you by name. I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. I have redeemed you, for I am the Lord your God. I am the Holy One of Israel. I am your Savior. Reminding us to stay connected to him, no matter what we face. Because, folks, the trials and tribulations, they're not over. Matter of fact, for many of us, they're just beginning. But the question is, are you connected to the true vine? For if you are, Jesus says, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you cannot do anything. Nothing. And the Scots can testify to that. And I believe every one of you here this morning watching online and outside under the tent, you can attest to that as well. I'm going to change the subject a little bit on you. Any of you Elvis Presley fans in here? You know, the world stopped when Elvis died in 1977. It did. It stopped for a while. It's like, what? The king is dead? This can't be. 
And many people went into depression. Matter of fact, there are still people that are depressed because Elvis is dead, or, or so we think he is. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of Elvis impersonators out there. All right, this is impromptu. I want to hear the best Elvis impersonation. We got anybody? Come on, somebody. Somebody. Nobody's going to do it. I did this illustration one time to a whole bunch of people, and like 15 people stood up and did it. I want somebody, anybody. Don't make me do it. You don't want me to do it. Nobody. There you go. There you go. We got one. Yes. So people were so consumed with him that they were claiming that they were a love child of Elvis. Yes. They wanted some benefit. And so there was this radio personality back in the 70s who created fake birth certificates. People could buy them saying that they were a child of Elvis. They paid $2 for those fake birth certificates. This DJ sold over 2,000 of those birth certificates. That's how much people were consumed with Elvis. I bet those fake birth certificates are worth more than $2 now. Maybe they're not, just like the baseball cards I have that I thought would be very valuable. They're not. I'm like, I got all these baseball cards. What am I going to do with them? But anyway... Before I roll my eyes, though, at fake Elvis, I have to remember how often I'm tempted to base my identity on shallow, temporary things. I mean, don't we sometimes connect our identity to our our neighborhood? Maybe the car that we drive, the house we live in, our job, our friends, our family, maybe our bank account. I have even connected my identity with my favorite college football team. If they're winning, I'm on top of the world. You know what I'm talking about? If they're winning, I'm on top of the world. But if they're losing, I'm like depressed. That's a shame, isn't it, to be that consumed with a sport? Hmm. And then you've got these psychologists and sociologists who study social media, and they say that social media is having a tremendous impact on people's notions of identity. Social media encourages us to link our identity with our appearance and the image we project. Not character, not intellect, not substance, but image. There's a social media influencer, and I shared this with the youth at Sunday school this morning, who has thousands upon thousands of followers from her various social media channels. Okay, back in 2020, this young lady posted these beautifully amazing pictures, perfectly posed pictures of her Instagram vacation to Bali. After receiving a lot of likes and shares, thousands upon thousands, I mean, the pictures went viral. She admitted that she had a photographer take those gorgeous exotic pictures at the local Ikea store. She did. She said she deliberately did this because she wanted to teach her fans a lesson, to question the images that they see on social media. As she said, sometimes people want to lie about who they are. It's not hard to do. Today, it's easier than ever to be anyone you want and to look as good as you want. Do you really think people look as good as they really do on Instagram or Snapchat or Facebook? you got all those filters nowadays. And doesn't it appear that you kind of get a little depressed about your life when you go through social media and you say, golly, they're living the dream. Man, they've got the life. Look at these pictures. Look at the smiles. That's not reality, folks. Please don't think that's reality. But that's the reality that your kids, your grandkids, your teenagers, your young adults, that's the world that they're trying to live up to, to be anyone who they want to be, when that's not real, is it? So where do you find your identity? Because your identity, who or what you identify with, shapes your life. It does. It impacts your values and your choices and your relationships. If your identity is rooted in being an athlete, you're not going to sit on the couch and binge watch Netflix all day. You're going to spend your spare time, you know, exercising, physical and mental endurance. 
If your identity is rooted in being a father, you're not going to ignore your children and miss all their baseball games and things or spend your paycheck on your own needs. You're going to pay close attention to your children's needs and budget wisely to provide for them. Let me ask you something. What do you hunger for? I mean, really, and I'm not talking about what you're going to eat after this service because realistically, you're already thinking about that. How long is service going to go today? It's because I'm ready to eat. I mean, I ate really early this morning, so I could eat right now, but I'm not going to. I'm going to wait because right now it's important that I feed on the food and drink of the Holy Spirit because that fills me to everlasting. What do you want? What do you want, really? What should you want? What do you praise? You know, what you praise is what you pursue. What's most important to you? The first thing that comes to your mind. Now, you're in church. I know you think you've got the right answer. But really, what's your main thing? What's most important to you? You become what you praise. You become what you worship. You become what's most important to you. Hmm. We're intended to be children of God. But yet the story of the Bible over and over again is about idols. People worshiping their idols. God revealing his full glory to everyone. You can't deny it. I'm looking at that sunrise at Stone Mountain. You cannot deny the glory of the Lord. It's powerful. It's overwhelming in a good way. And yet I, too, have my idols. I already mentioned a few of them. College football. Food. <laughs> Probably a quarter of you, maybe more of you, would raise your hand if I asked you if that was your idols, too. There are things that we idolize, and we claim that our relationship with the Lord is the most important, but yet sometimes, especially on the weekend, what's the last thing we think about doing? I don't have to say it, do I? Hmm. Every one of us worships something, and we become conformed to it. Hmm. What are you known for? What are you known for? If I ask folks in the community... What is Missy Creek Community Church known for? One of the first things they say, you guys are so outward focused. You serve. You're missional. You attend to the needs of others. You provide food and shelter. And you visit. And you care. I love hearing that. That's wonderful, isn't it? But how about you? You personally, individually, what are you known for? Do you care what people say about you? Well, in a perfect sermon, which you've never heard one of those before, but in a perfect sermon, I'd say we don't care about what anybody else thinks other than the Lord. But you know you care about what others think. You get depressed if you don't get enough likes on your social media. You wonder, do they not like me anymore? Do they not care? They didn't like, they liked so-and-so's post, but they didn't like my picture. Do you realize there's an algorithm associated with social media? That not everybody's going to see your post? That you really don't have 3,300, no, 3,346 friends? You really don't? You just think you do? You're lucky if you have 46 of those 3,346 that are really close friends. You're fortunate if you have five friends that will lay down their lives for you. Even one. But the one that matters the most has already laid down his life for you. That's Jesus Christ. He is the one that matters. But yet you still care what people think. And I don't think that's a bad thing if your priority is in the right place. If you're representing God and it's his glory that you seek, then you want others to see his glory in you. You don't want them to see you. You want to see him manifested in you. You want others to see the God overflowing through you that he's oozing out of you to the point that other people want to taste and see how good that Lord is. They want to follow the Lord through you, not follow you because you ain't got anything. But God is everything. And they want to follow the example you're leading through Christ. That's what they want. 
So what do people think of you? Oh, he's a great golfer. She's a terrific accountant. She's a super mom. How about this? She's a Christian accountant. She's a Christian mom. He's a Christian golfer. If Jesus is your main thing, make him your main thing. Make him your focus. Make him your priority. That song, they will know we are Christians by our love, that's how you do it. You reciprocate the love of Jesus. You love regardless. He commanded us to love one another. It's not a declarative. It's an imperative. It's a must-do. You know, there were some families in our church that recently went to Disney, and the big slogan is, time to do the must-dos. You know, love is a must-do. It's an imperative. It is a command. Jesus didn't make a lot of commands, but he said love. They will know we are Christians by our love. You can say you're a Christian all day long, but if you don't love your enemies, then how are people really going to know any difference between you and the world? That's the teaching of the truth that you're hearing this morning, folks. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness, or are you a phony? Are you faking it? You want people to think that you've got it all together, like on social media. Man, he dresses cool. He looks cool. Man, that guy can snowboard. You know you can't. You just got a picture of you on the snowboard, making it look like you can. You're on the bunny slope. We know. You're not getting away with anything. It's that perception, that false perception. Is that the same way you live in your faith life, a false perception? In our lesson from today, Jesus gives us our birth certificate, our identity, and it's not a fake one like the child of Elvis certificate. Jesus reveals the source of our identity, and it's out of this identity that we find hope and strength and the foundation for our lives. I am the vine, said Jesus. You are the branches. Have you ever thought about how much hope there is in that little sentence, I am the vine, you are the branches? There's a lot of hope in that, isn't there? We find our identity in being connected with someone or something. Our identity is shaped by our connection to our parents and our family, our teachers, our coaches, our friends, our community. And we live in a wonderful community, don't we? When another person sees you and values you and wants the best for you, that is what shapes your identity. We find our identity in our connection to others. That's why it's important to be doing what we're doing right here, connecting in the flesh. The author of Hebrews says, let us not give up on being with one another, worshiping God together, outside, inside, and sometimes even online to be intentional about our faith journey. It's our responsibility, parents that are here this morning, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, great-grandparents, godfathers, godmothers, to cultivate our children's relationship with God. It's our responsibility to teach them the truth, to make sure that they're in worship, to make sure that they're at youth group, to make sure that they're in the children's ministry, to make sure that they're growing, to make sure that every day, some point in their day is dedicated to their faith, not skipping a day, not skipping a week. You go on vacation, you don't go on vacation from the Lord. You don't. Just want to remind us of that. In today's lesson, Jesus gives us the ultimate gift. He says, you are connected to me. And you're not just connected to me. You are now part of my very substance, my very essence. You're not alone. Your life is not random. It's not meaningless. The divine nature, the wisdom, the life, the joy that flows Through me now, Jesus says, flows through you, that you may have my joy and that your joy may be complete. He completes you, doesn't he? If you stay connected to Christ, you have meaning and purpose for your life. If you're not connected to Christ, there's no meaning, 
There's no purpose. You're nothing but shadows and dust. A quote from the movie Gladiator, if you ever watched it. Just shadows and dust. But you're more than that. Because your creator, your God, your savior, he formed you, molded you, knit you from the very dust of the earth. And he breathed into you his very substance, his very essence. You are holy and you are set apart. Mm. Jesus is divine. It is he that nourishes our hungry spirits. We seek in vain when we look for nourishment in other places. I ask you, what are you hungry for? Who are you hungry for? When we're disconnected from the source of life, the creator God, the God who claims us as his masterpiece, then we are tempted to find our identity in some poor and worthless substitutes. Who are your idols? What are your idols? What are your substitutes? In Christ alone, we find our identity. That's it. Struggling with your identity? Are you? It's a big topic nowadays, right? Find your identity in Christ. You don't have to read between the lines on that. Find your identity in Christ. He will define who you are and whose you are. He has created you. Are you ready, church? Here we go. He has created you either a woman or a man. You will never be a they. You're a woman or a man. You're a child of the king. You have the Holy Spirit living and breathing within you. And when you receive Jesus Christ, he baptizes you with his spirit and he sets you free from any identity crisis. He makes you a new creation. That's a tough teaching for people. Why do we make it tough? Because the world has. I'm going to go back there in just a few moments, but hold on with me, okay? I want you to listen to the full message. Don't try to take what I just said out of context. Listen to the full message. You're going to get the full portion today. In 1930, there was a Great Depression. It devastated households across the nation. A young mother named Mary had a crisis of faith, a crisis of identity. Mary and her husband had five children to feed, and they're in the middle of the depression. Her husband's pay was cut severely. She took on laundry and ironing to make a little money, but they were barely scraping by. One day, the local grocer accused Mary's oldest son of stealing food from the grocery store. If you've ever felt like your life was spinning out of control and you can't see any hope for the future, then you understand the dark place that Mary was in. She went home, turned on the gas heater in her house. She laid in bed with her children and waited for the gas to kill them. But as she lay there in the quiet... Mary heard a song playing on the radio in the kitchen. She had forgotten to shut off the radio. And the song that was playing was, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. This song was written in the 1800s by a young man who had suffered a terrible tragedy himself. And yet he was able to write the words, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Struggling with your identity and who you are? Pray. Seek God's guidance. God, I want to be who you have called me to be. I want to be who you have created me to be. I want to live in you and in nothing else. 
Release me from my flesh. I surrender to your will. You are my best friend. That song that day saved not only a mother, but her five young children. You cannot tell me there is not power in music, folks. Why are we drawn here? Primarily the Holy Spirit, but it's worship. It's through the music that we hear the voice of God speaking to us. We've all come desiring to hear something from the Lord. And whether we know the tune of the song or maybe we, we don't like it, it's not for us to like anyway. It's for us to offer ourselves as living holy sacrifices, pleasing to him. And so when we're singing, when we're looking at those lyrics, they mean something. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. There's power in those words, isn't there? There is. My name is forgiven. You've been forgiven. You've been set free. There's power in those words. As Mary listened to the words of what a friend we have in Jesus, in her own words she says, I realized that I had made a tragic mistake I had tried to fight all my terrible battles alone. I jumped up, turned off that gas, opened the door, raised the windows. She spent the rest of the day in prayer and in thanking God for the blessings she and her husband had. Mary and her husband still had struggles ahead of them. They lost their house. But they and their children made it through the Depression. Many years later, Mary was able to look back at that day when she almost ended her life and the lives of her children and say that she is so thankful that God woke her up to the blessings of life. Are you ready to be woke up, church? Does the world need to be woke up to the blessings of Christ and his truth and who he is for who he is and what he's done? Yes. It's time to wake up, sleeper. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber on all of his holy mountain. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. So you can go to the beach. You can go to the lake. You can fake snowboard, and he's still there with you. You can praise him in the morning. You can praise him in the evening. You can praise him casting your Zepco 33. You don't even know what that is, but you can praise him at all times because he is where you find your identity. And nothing else. Can you get more excited about praising him and loving him and worshiping him than you can when your team does win? Yes, you can. Even more so. Mary, back to that mother, when she was at her most desperate, hopeless point, she was reminded of a very simple thing, but more complex than you might imagine, that Jesus loves her. Jesus endured a lot and went through a lot. He was wounded severely to show you just how deep, wide, long, high is the love of God. He is her hope and her strength. And she had forgotten her connection to the God who loves her, who sees her, who knows her needs, who came in human form to experience her struggles and heartbreaks once she rediscovered her identity, her connection to Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? Once she discovered her identity, her connection to Jesus Christ, she fought back against despair and reclaimed her life. You see, your life is not your own. You may think it is, but he owns you. And when I say that, I don't mean in a submissive way, in a kick-you-down way. You do want to submit to his authority. But he sets you free to be who he created you to be. For if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. It's wonderful when you know who your identity is rooted in and you no longer go around sinning. You no longer go to bed at night guilty or confused or worrying. Those things don't exist anymore. Because you've placed all your cares, you've casted them upon the Lord who knows exactly what you face and what you go through.
And though he may not eradicate all that immediately from your life, because he didn't come into the world to take all that away, but he did come into this world to fill you with his presence and his peace, which, by the way, passes all understanding. You're not going to reason it. Actually, reasoning and questioning him is actually a good thing, but that, that means that you have faith. Oh, you non-believers and agnostics out there that have been questioning God for years, you probably have faith in the aver- more faith than the average Christian because at least you're communicating and you're asking the questions. And as you ask, he will reveal himself to you through other people. So listen the next time you go out to eat with a believer and they're talking to you. Get away from your selfishness and your over-analytic brain and listen to the voice of truth speak to you through one of his disciples. And your life will be transformed right there in the midst of the coffee shop or over a hamburger. That's the truth, folks. That's the power of God. Whew. I know that's what you want me to say, Lord. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to do it. Hmm. There are some people who will seek what they need in their neighborhood bar. (laughs) I crossed through this. I wasn't going to talk about this, but they are. They seek what they need in their neighborhood bar. Do you know the neighborhood bar? We've got a lot of neighborhood bars around. You know? Drown my troubles away. There's a country song about that. (laughs) You know what it is. Some will seek what they need in sitting in front of the television or staring at their smartphone For hour after hour after hour after hour. Honey, I love you. Honey, how was your day today? Huh? Really? Is this more important than somebody telling you that they love you? Asking about your day? Come on. But it is, isn't it? You're guilty. You'll do it today in the restaurant. You have a perfect chance over lunch today to converse and talk about this message And yet you'll be scrolling down to see if the Braves lost a third time in a row. You will. Your draft pick, who is it? Who's in the eighth round? Your stocks, your investments, your social status. Is that your identity? Is that where you spend most of your time? You know, others will seek to find what they need in art or philosophy or some bizarre personal indulgences. All other streets except that marked Christ, however, are dead-ended. They're dead ends. They lead to nothing. This is the truth of the gospel, folks. It's not our outer, outer circumstances that determine our inner happiness. Some people, surrounded by every convenience and luxury, waller in inner despair. Seems like they have everything. You see it on social media. Media. Seems like they've got it all, but they're wallowing in inner despair. Others in the most adverse of circumstances arrive above those circumstances. They rise above their circumstances and claim amazing victories. It all depends on who you're connected to. Are you connected to the vine? Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. It is he who also links us to one another. We not only have connections in high places, we also have connections in low places and in between places. We're connected to one another as branches linked to the vine of Christ. There's a woman named Stephanie Lux. Maybe you've heard about her and her post. She posted online about the members of her church and their love for a teenage boy who was undergoing treatment for a brain tumor. During the pandemic, no one could visit The boy, because the cancer treatment suppressed his immune system. But his church family was determined to show their love and support for this boy. So they organized a community drive-by. Hundreds of cars drove slowly past his house, honking their horns and flashing their headlights to let this young man know that his church members were praying for him. Many of you know stories like this, don't you? Many of you have been a part of a story like that. Some of you have been isolated in your home and folks from this community of faith showed up and brought you Holy Communion or brought you some soup or brought you several meals when you were going through something. You know what that's like, don't you? 
put signs out on your front lawn. Maybe you didn't care for those signs because you're a grass perfectionist. I know from experience. But we do it anyway. We live in a world that can be awfully lonely, whether you are at the top or at the bottom. We need to affirm and embrace the idea that we are a family with every believer in Jesus Christ in this world. We are one. We are a family. Who could be lonely with such a family? When we are linked to Christ, other people do become our people. Many of them also have connections in high places, and that makes us family. But there's one more thing to be said. He is the vine. We are the, ran- van- the branches. It is he that gives us the ability to bear fruit. He gives us the ability. What does it mean to bear fruit? It means that all of our actions are motivated by and reflect the spirit and character of Jesus. Bearing fruit means letting the spirit of Jesus inspire all of our actions, not just our actions in church, but our actions on the job and on the sports field and at school and out with our friends and on social media and when we're all alone and nobody is looking. Bearing fruit is what life is all about. And when we stay connected to Jesus, when we cultivate a daily relationship with him, his spirit and values will fill our minds and our hearts and our actions will start to reflect and be changed to reflect his actions. Yesterday at the Homelessness Symposium, I was reminded of a story in the book, Same Kind of Different, as me. Authors Ron Hall and Denver Moore tell about a time when Mr. Moore was living at a homeless shelter. One day a car drove up and an elderly man was pushed out onto the sidewalk. The man was was drunk and when Denver Moore tried to help him up, the man spat at him and cursed him and used vile racial slurs to get rid of him. Now what would you do if you were in Denver Moore's place? (laughs) Honestly, I would have thought about leaving that old man on the sidewalk to sober up. But Denver helped him up off the pavement and took him inside the shelter. The elderly man's name was Mr. Ballantyne. Denver soon learned that Mr. Ballantyne hated people of color and he hated Christians. And Denver was both of those things. But in spite of Mr. Ballantyne's treatment, Denver kept reaching out to him. He brought him hot meals. When Mr. Ballantyne was put into a government-run nursing home, Denver visited him and cleaned his room. At every visit, Mr. Ballantyne cursed him and called him names. One day, Denver brought a friend to visit Mr. Ballantyne, and that friend later sent Mr. Ballantyne some cigarettes he had requested. Mr. Ballantyne was troubled by this gesture. Why would that man buy me cigarettes when he doesn't even know me? Ballantyne asked. Because he's a Christian, Denver answered. Well, I still don't understand. And anyway, you know I hate Christians, Ballantyne protested. Denver paused before telling him, I'm a Christian. In that very moment, Mr. Ballantyne experienced a change of heart. He began apologizing for all those times he had cursed Denver and called him horrible names. And Denver said that the reason he had spent the last three years taking care of Mr. Ballantyne's, Mr. Ballantyne, because he knew that God loved him. Mr. Ballantyne responded, I've lived too long and sinned too much for God to forgive me. On the other hand, I'm too old for much more sinning. Maybe that'll count for something. That was the last day Mr. Ballantyne called Denver any more rude names. And not long after that, Mr. Ballantyne attended church with Denver. He was 85 years old, and it was the first time that he had ever stepped foot in a church. And he loved it. Because Denver Moore found his identity and his hope and his strength in Jesus Christ, he was able to reflect the Spirit of Christ in his actions, even to a mean-spirited old man filled with hate. And Denver Moore's Christ-like actions bore fruit in the life of Mr. Ballantyne. 
Now imagine how much more your life could change if you found your identity in your connection to Jesus. And how many lives could you impact if your life consistently and authentically reflected the spirit of Jesus? Don't settle for a mediocre life. Don't do it. Don't spend your time and energy on this earth chasing after a meaningless lifestyle. Cultivate your relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you will find the true purpose of a fruitful life that reflects Jesus' spirit. Now, here's what I wanted to get back to and tell you, okay? People are leaving the church. They are in droves. The pandemic has really not helped that. People stopped going, started watching, and they're not returning. Some people aren't watching anymore, and if they are, they're fast-forwarding to get to what they want to get to, to get, it, to get it over with. I need to get back to the rest of my day. This takes too long. Gosh. That's sad, isn't it? People are compromising the standards of God because the church isn't requiring enough of them. Man, Stephen's doing it today, isn't he? What in the world? I'm not sure about this place. I just wanted to come and sit down, you know, get a little worship on, get me a donut hole and a tangerine before I leave and some coffee. That's all I really wanted to do today. Gosh, I don't know if I'm coming back here or not. You know, I've got my little check-off list, and I was just going to check it off. Got my worship on today. Can't wait to get home, watch the game, take a nap, do what I want to do. Seriously, right? The church, I'm talking about the church in general, folks. The church that I've been a part of my whole life has been diluting the gospel for decades, trying to appease everybody, make everybody happy, make everybody feel good. This group of people over here, this group of people, it's okay to be this, it's okay to say that, it's okay to do this, it's okay to have this kind of lifestyle. It's fine and dandy to do what you want to do. The church has been affirming that for decades, for a long time, to make them feel good. Let me ask you something. Is there anything in your life that's not bearing fruit? Anything. If there's anything in your life that's not bearing fruit, I, I, I make sure you see me and hear me on this. If there's anything in your life that's not bearing fruit, stop doing it. Stop wasting time. God's only giving you so much time. And when you commit your time to him, he will compensate you. Not necessarily financially, which he'll do that too if you're generous. But he will compensate you with insights on how to better prioritize your time. You have the same amount of time as I do and everybody else. But he will give you more time. It will seem like it. Because he'll give you insight into how to better utilize your time and bear fruit. That's exactly what this verse of Scripture from John's Gospel is telling us today. If you remain in me, I will remain in you. But apart from me, you're nothing. Nada. Nothing. You can have all your cars, all your money, and all the things that you worship. But that is not the adventure God wants to take you on. God, the church should, but God requires, guess what? everything, the entire hokey pokey. You put your whole self in, not just part, not just a finger, the entire being you put in. The instinct of a true Christian is to go where the suffering is, to go where the pain is. Christ never used fear and intimidation as a message, as a method to bear fruit. He never used fear and intimidation as a method to bear fruit. Although there are those in the church at high levels who use this message of fear and intimidation to confuse and hurt others. That's not what we've been called to do. Our goal as Christians, are you ready? Here it is. You'll be glad you came to church today or you're watching. 
Our goal as Christians is to become like Christ. I didn't really have to say all that other stuff today. All I needed to get up here and say our goal is to become like Christ. But I need to teach you and share with you what God's Word says about that so you can fully live in that, right? The goal of every baptized person is to become holy. When you're baptized, that old you is left in the water, maybe in the font, however that works. You're left in the water. That old you and the new you comes forward. New creations in Christ. We heard that from our worship pastor today. We are new creations in Christ. The old is gone. The new springs forward. We're new people. We seek to become holy. You know, Mother Teresa, she went into Calcutta and she bore the suffering and the woundness of the poor. It was in being Jesus to them that she bore much fruit and could then share Jesus with them. That's how you do it. You show them Jesus. And then you can share Jesus with them. Mother Teresa stayed connected to the vine no matter her circumstances, no matter the poverty, no matter the wounds, no matter the smell. She remained connected to the vine. Paul says, where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Voila, that's Christianity. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. That's Christianity. Will you go into this sin-filled world and connect people to the vine? Christ bore all of our sin, all of our dysfunction. And we know we got dysfunction in the family, don't we? All of us do. We do. He bore it all, every bit of it, into himself. The wounds of Jesus are a sign of the world's dysfunction, that the world turn its back even on the Messiah the Son of God. Do not be afraid to show your wounds, your scars. Don't be afraid. I knew a little boy. He had heart surgery. When he was a little boy, I was with him at the hospital and his parents. I'll never forget it. And for years afterward, he wouldn't take his shirt off because he had this scar. He had this wound. And then he encountered the Messiah, Jesus, and made him Lord of his life. And he identified with the wounds and the scars. And I saw him at a sixth grade party out on the Davenport with his shirt off and with his scar showing to show the whole world. Look at my scar. Jesus had scars too. And he jumped off the diving board. Yes, I just said something about you, Harris Gallagher. He's almost 17 years old now. Huh. Don't be afraid to show your wounds. Tell your rescue story. Don't forget to thank God every day for the gift of sharing His grace with others. Do you know that gratitude is a form of faith? You will automatically be more happy if you're thankful. You start feeling bad, you want to flick somebody off, just start praising God and being thankful. You'll be happier that very moment and you'll forget about flipping that person off. It's true. The more thankful you are, the more happier you'll be. So I want us to come to the table today and let Jesus nourish our hungry spirits by linking us to the right connection, the vine. Let's remember that your spiritual resume, all this stuff that you've done that you think is so important, that it's useless without God's grace. It's useless if you're not connected to the vine. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And if you remain in me, fruit will abound, abundant in measure. Come taste the fruit and see, because apart from me, you can do nothing. So this morning we come to feed on the food and drink of the Holy Spirit, reminding us that this is the body of Christ that's broken for us for all of humankind, and that this juice symbolizes his blood that was shed, redeeming us and setting us free. It just so happens that this is grape juice, that it comes from a vine, <laughs> right? And so you're literally feeding on the living, breathing body and blood of Christ today. We believe that as Christians, that he is present with us through the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so I want us to pray now.
I want us to pray that the Holy Spirit would descend down upon us. Lord, I pray that your Spirit would now ascend, descend, descend upon this bread, upon this juice, that your Holy Spirit would descend upon each one of us. Make this bread and this juice become the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And make us the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, setting us free to no longer be uh, identified by what the world says, but to claim our identity that's in Christ Jesus, that we are children of the King. Thank you for saving us and setting us apart. If you're sitting in here, outside, watching online, and you've never personally asked Jesus to be your Savior, I want you to do that right now. Wherever you are, you might get on your knees. You might just say these words, Lord, I surrender to your will. You're my main thing. I desire to be more like you. I surrender everything. I will follow you, Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. For my waywardness, when I've fallen short of you, created to me, created me to be, redeem me and make me whole. I bow before you right now. And I seek to pledge my allegiance to you forever and ever until I meet you in eternity. I will lift mine eyes from the hills. From whence my help cometh, my help cometh from you, Lord. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen.